Good evening. My name is Carol Dunnitz. I am your host tonight for Ann Arbor Access. And I am delighted to have Dale Leslie with us. Dale is a longtime resident of Ann Arbor. He was born here, did his master's degree at the University of Michigan, worked in the family business for many years. In more recent years, he's gotten very involved with local history. And I know we're going to really enjoy hearing a lot about that. Dale, thank you so much for being with us this evening. I know that years ago when you were in the service, you were very involved with broadcast in Alaska. Right. How have you come from broadcast work in Alaska <laughs> to historical research here in Ann Arbor? Well, I've always had an interest in expressing myself. Uh, and there's usually two formal ways of doing it. One is through the written word and, and the other is speaking. So for many years uh, as an avocation, I did a fair amount of writing. Uh, but then I discovered the value of the visual element. And, <clears throat> and a few years ago, I started to do a lot of history reporting on digital, photog and digital photography, which is a very inexpensive, a very practical way uh, of recording history events and the people that are involved in them. What, what I'm wondering is, I know you have a way of, of honing in, on, in into unusual topics that haven't <laughs> been covered. How, where have you gotten that ability? I don't know. I can't really explain it. I just have kind of an inherent feeling about certain things that, that I think people ought to know about. And not only do I think they ought to know about it, but I think they would be interested to know about it. And there's so many people and so many events in this community that never get formally reported. And uh, I know I can't do every single one, but I try to be somewhat selective as to how much interest there would be. So I try to find uh, different events and different people that deserve some recognition, but for whatever reason, haven't received any. And uh, those are the people that I have featured in uh, over a hundred programs wow. that I have, uh, that we air on YouTube, um, soup to nuts. How, mean, how long have you been doing this? Well, I think we started in uh, 2009, I believe, was when we started. I say we. Jim Campbell is my uh, producer of my of my programs. He does all the photographic work, uh -huh. and uh, we just kind of work together and. Uh, and I, I tip my hat to him because I do, I do most of the vocal stuff, but he's the one that inserts the graphics that support what I'm saying or what the person I'm interviewing is saying. So it's a real interesting combination and not terribly profound perhaps, but I think it's very entertaining for someone. Well, I know it's meaningful because it haven't, it hasn't the Bentley Library, the historical library connected with you and, and started a file of your work there? Yes. When yes. did that happen? Well, this was a couple years ago. I mean, this is probably the greatest thrill next to the birth of my children. <laughs> I got a letter in the mail from the uh, Bentley Library, which is located, of course, on the U of M North Campus. And they're a renowned library for historical purposes. And the letter said they would like to establish a letters file for me. What that means is a file of some of my historic collection and make it available you know to researchers uh, through the years so there might be someone that's not even born yet that will watch something that I've produced oh I, I think I, undoubtedly <laughs> so. well tell let's let's talk about some of the interesting things you've covered I know one thing that's of interest to me and that I was really never aware of until I saw one of your programs was the gargoyles that are inside the entrance of the area that, that takes you into the law quad. Right. Can you right. tell us something about that? Well, that was a surprise to me, too. I lived here my whole life, and I never knew they existed. But when you enter the courtyard, the archway has gargoyles. Actually, they're not, gargoyles are usually spouting water, OK? Uh, these are not spouting water, but I guess they still could be gargoyles. They're uh, fashioned, uh, you know, uh, replicas of uh, 
the presidents of the U of M. So wow. You know, I, I think we have a visual for that, and I hope that uh, it'll be put up for people to see. Okay. And I think what's shown there is, is a photograph of the first president. Uh, was it Angel who was the first president? No, no, he wasn't the first president, oh. but he was... Uh, Certainly one of the most interesting, shall we say. Well, he was, he was, there, he was president of U of M for many, many years, yes, I think. Yes, he was. But the photograph we have, do you recall who, who that's a photograph of and the gargoyle of that president? I think that's, uh, yeah, I believe that is. Uh, Angel? Angel, yes, I well, believe so. In any case, there, I think, how many presidents were actually, did, did the sculptors create uh, gargoyles for? I think there's six or seven. Uh -huh. um, they kind of, I'm not sure why they quit doing it. Uh, but it, uh, it, there's quite a, a stream of them. And, it, uh, it would have been nice when they did the addition to the law school if they had done gargoyles of subsequent presidents. But I've heard other people say that. But on this, on this film, we we're fortunate enough to have Winston Stevens, who has recently passed away, but in his day was perhaps self-anointed, but the historian of Ann Arbor. Your forerunner? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. He'd laugh if you were here. <laughs> I hope they'll put up the, the video now okay. that we can look at uh, of, of him speaking. Was it before the Kiwanis Club? No, actually, oh yes it was. Excuse me, it was. Mm -hmm. Angel was here for 38 years as president. Enough of these three, three year and six year terms. Uh, Angel stuck to it. 1871 to 1909. He kept begging the regents to let him go, let him retire. He was 82 when he first begged to retire. I think they finally let him go when he was 82. He was a little younger than that when he first begged for the retirement. But the regents couldn't understand how the university would function without him. They'd never known another president, another leader. So they kept him in harness until 82. Then they let him retire and live in the president's house on the campus uh, for the rest of his life. Because luckily his successor, the dean of the law school, Harry Burns Hutchins, didn't need to live on the campus. He already had his house on the corner of Monroe and Packard. It's burned down since, since he lived there. Dale, I know that you uh, interviewed Al Renfrew uh, on the patio in the back of his home. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I got to know Al um, mainly because he and I would have coffee together down in Washington Dairy. And for those that don't know, he uh, attended the University of Michigan. After he graduated, he coached at the University of Michigan, the ice hockey team. And after his coaching career was over, he became the ticket manager at the University of Michigan in the athletic department. So basically, he pretty much spent his whole, at least working career, here at the university. And he was very highly thought of, but perhaps somewhat forgotten as the years went by. Well, you weren't gonna let that happen, no, were you? No, in fact, I said to him, has anyone ever sat down and interviewed you at length? Well, I don't think anybody would wanna do that, Dale. I said, yes, I do, I wanna do it. Well, when would we do it? And so I arranged for it to happen in his backyard on his patio. And it was a beautiful day, and we sat there. And it was very relaxed. And we went over his life, you know, and uh, quite, quite interesting. Even some things that I learned that I didn't know before. But uh, Like what? Oh, well, the, I didn't realize that he heavily recruited Canada. That's where the best Canadian talent or the best hockey talent came from. And uh, one of those recruiting uh, trips, he discovered or was told about Gordon Red Berenson, who just retired a couple years ago as a very successful player and coach of the men's hockey team at the University of Michigan. So um, I, there's a lot of behind the scenes that, uh, work that goes on. Uh, people don't even uh, begin to realize when they see a, a team in, in play that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to get those players there and to coach them properly. And uh, another thing he started, he's the one that started the idea of having the big pennant uh, up at the uh, entrance to the tunnel at Michigan Stadium. So if you recall, the players run out of the tunnel, 
Michigan players, run out of the tunnel and they go under this big banner that said, M go blue. That evolved out of an idea that he had and some others, and uh, it's now a, a trademark. But see, nobody knows these things. I mean, you know, and uh, so I tried to get out of him as much as I could. And again, tipping my hat to uh, Jim, he did a great job of uh, showing uh, graphics of Al's career. And uh, we, really, we really covered the gamut of, of a very successful and talented person. He, was, he had such a wry sense of humor. He said, well, you know, I'm going to be 80. I said, well, keep it up, Al. You'll make it to 90. Don't need to. I feel like I'm 90 right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sports has really been, for, for as long as I can remember, a very big thing at U of M. Oh, yes. And it seems to me that you interviewed someone else, Bill Stegath? Well, big, Bill Stegath had an interesting story. Now, again, these things are interesting to me. Hopefully they are to other people. He was one of only three men to ever do uh, Michigan football play-by-play -play on WUOM. And uh, for many years, he was the voice of Michigan football. And uh, then he went on to uh, become a member of the alumni office staff. And uh, he headed up Camp Michigania, which is the U of M camp up in the northern part of Michigan. I used to go there with my kids when you they did? were small. Yeah, oh. we used to have a wonderful time there. Well, when I was there, they have these pictures of the staff from years past and I, you know you, you flip back far enough and here's Bill you know <laughs> he's posing just like everybody else but uh, what a gentleman he was he had he was a highly uh, thought of uh, Air Force pilot mm -hmm. and uh, attended uh, Michigan you know as an undergrad and uh, was from Escanaba up in the UP and he just he was a colorful guy so I had to capture him I just had to and I did and he was somewhat a little bit reluctant because, uh, you know, most people in general don't like the spotlight shining on them. Uh -huh. But I think I convinced him that it was going to be very relaxed. And uh, again, that's one of the programs that's on my YouTube site. You know, you mentioned Camp Michigania, and that triggers something else. Uh, my recollection is that when you go for your week at Michigania, that they often have speakers, and the speakers typically are people who have taught or been involved at the university. Right. And I believe that one person who was invited up there to speak was Ken Fisher. Yes. And I, I know you've got some stories <laughs> to tell about Ken as well, who just retired, was it last year, yes. from University Musical yes. Society? Well, this is a prime example to me of someone who distinguished himself and never was really, he never sat down and talked to anyone where it could be recorded for uh, historical reasons, posterity, certainly. And he was a very entertaining man. <laughs> I guess he should be in the business he was in. And the program that we came up with that's on my YouTube site is a comprehensive look back over the University Music Society. I don't know if that had ever been done in a formal way before. Well, how far does that go back? Went back into the, uh, well, it's in the turn of the century, of the last century I'm talking about. So it's quite a history there. I think it's 132 years now that uh, it's been in existence. And he was the, the chairperson for 30 of those years. That's amazing. Yes. I think uh, Hill Auditorium, though, wasn't built until uh, the, the mid-teens? Yes. yes. And he's, of course, always quick to point out that that really put the U of M on the map. They had one of the top drawer music halls in the country, and people wanted to perform here. The I think we have a video to run oh, about this, okay. and uh, then we can talk some more about okay. it. If we didn't have Hill Auditorium, we wouldn't be anywhere uh, near what we are now, and that's because of a bequest of uh, Arthur Hill, and then he was able to find the right architect for this, and that's Albert Kahn, who's world famous. And Hill opened in, in uh, 1913 with Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And the significance is that we now have a hall with, uh, that was large enough to have the entire student body of the University of Michigan in it. But look at these artists here. 
Imagine Segovia, the guitarist, without amplification being able to be heard by 4,200 people. Here are the other artists. To have that combination of, gr of big size and great acoustics made this really unique. And here's the first audience, that photo, um, in uh, May 14, 1913. Now, Charlie Sink's name was brought up. There's probably nobody that had a greater impact. He was with us from 1904 to 1968. I mean, that guy preceded me just one removed. That's 113 years that three of us have led the organization. I think we like it. <laughs> but he brought Caruso here in 1919, the most famous singer in the world he brought here to Ann Arbor. I don't have time for this whole story. It's fascinating. If there's time for the q and I'll tell you about it. So what's the significance here? It's what Charlie said about this. If the great artist is out there, just go get them. Don't apologize for being a small Midwest town. We've got the hall and we've got the audience. Let's bring them here. The year, when, when does Hill open? 1913. What happens from 14 to 18? First World War. Not everybody was coming to concerts and yet you had this 4,700 seat hall, okay? How do you get people back in the house after the war? Because, you know, we need, to, we need to build things up. So, Charlie Sink says the way we do this is get the most famous singer in the world to come to Ann Arbor. So he gets in touch with the manager in New York and says, I'd like to come to uh, speak with Mr. Caruso about coming to Ann Arbor. And Caruso says, where, uh, uh, his manager says, where the hell is that? <laughs> and the other thing you need to know, Mr. What's your name, Sink? You can't afford him. So Charlie, um, went to get, he went, went to New York to make sure that that's exactly what the situation was. He won't come to Ann Arbor and you can't afford him. So Charlie said, well, how much is the fee? $13,850. Charlie didn't blink an eye, but that was kind of like the budget for the whole year for UMS. <laughs> he came back and gathered the board of the Musical Society and said, how do we do this? So what's the objective? Get people back in their seats. But everybody wanted to hear the greatest singer in the world in Ann Arbor at this new auditorium. So the board of the Musical Society came up with this scheme. You want to hear Caruso? Then you buy your season tickets for the 1919, 1920, and 1921 seasons in advance. Then you are eligible to buy a $15 ticket to uh, uh, hear, hear Caruso. And that's how they did it. And so what, what, what happened? People came back in the seats, they packed the house again, and they were off and running. But that is the imagination of those guys that preceded me. Dale, I know that in the video, Ken talks about uh, the preparations that were done and the encouragement to get, en get Enrico Caruso oh, to come yes. perform at Hill Auditorium. But when all was said and done, he didn't, he didn't come then, did he? Well, he did. I think he did come, uh -huh. but uh, what happened, there was a uh, uh, flu ep epidemic that was sweeping through much of the Midwest, and as a result, they shut down all the public buildings, and uh, many of the businesses had to close their doors. So here there's, there was this big, big buildup, and he came. I think he did come. No, I, th I think what happened, he came, a few, he came the following March. Is yeah, well, yes, it oh. was rescheduled. Yes, uh -huh. It was, but... Uh, you know, this is the top tenor in the world. I mean, this was, uh, well, as he described, uh, quite a coup for the U of M to uh, have him come here. But it, he had several visits, as I understand it, uh, even though this was the one that really kicked it off. So, but so many famous uh, musicians have performed here. We're just very spoiled. Uh, really, like in, in, the people who go only to the biggest cities also come to Ann Arbor, is yes, my understanding. Yes. So when, when you uh, spoke with Ken, and, and I think, did, where did he speak when you, when you videotaped Again, him? it was a talk to Kiwanis. Uh -huh. What other kinds of things did you glean from him? Well, first of all, I want to say this was his last presentation uh, as director of the UMS. Uh, from this point forward, he, of course, left his position. So uh -huh. we, we captured him as the last formal speaking engagement that he completed. So I feel kind of special about that but um, oh he just he shared on how different arrangements had to be made certain artists <laughs> we had their own idiosyncrasies on what they required uh, backstage and uh, 
Oh, I was just, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a couple other things that he mentioned that. Uh, well, you and I had talked about Leonard Bernstein. Oh, yes. And uh, perhaps you could share something about uh, his visits to Ann Arbor yes. for UMS. That certainly was another uh, an accomplished person that uh, was here. And uh, the thing that always amazed Ken is how open these artists were to meeting with their public. And uh, I think it was uh, him that, uh, asked Ken if he could continue talking to the students, and they went down on Main Street to a bar down there. Was it Old Heidelberg? I think that... Uh... I don't know. It was, that's one that's not there now. But he, you know, he, was, he just loved being around these students that were interested in music. I think it was marvelous. I, I heard that he, they talked till 4 in the morning. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it certainly is you know, remarkable. Yes. Who else have you uh, interviewed, you either one-on-one -on -one or had come speak and uh, observed? Well, let's see. I'm trying to think who. Uh, some, one thing, uh, one interview I had, which I think is interesting, is with a 101-year-old farmer from rural Ann Arbor uh -huh. who donated his farm to Washtenaw County, and it's being converted into a site for for visitors to come to. Well, I, I Donald mean, Stabler is his name. What will it be used for? Well, it, it, it's going to be part of the park system, Washtenaw County Parks. Uh -huh. uh, he wanted his farm to not just get divided into a subdivision, which most of them are these days. Sure. So Don Stabler gave his farm to the county with yeah. the caveat that he could live there until he passed away. So uh, this is kind of funny, but Ten years went by. <laughs> they weren't expecting that. <laughs> they were, I mean, I mean, no taxes. No, I mean, you know, let's talk about a free lunch. He got it, but uh, very interesting. He he walks the tour of the farm, you know, reflecting on his days there. And there's a number of articles, uh, equipment primarily, that he used during his years on the farm, that he describes and shows you how they work and. Uh, very interesting, uh, and he is—he was such a great uh, speaker himself. You know, uh, giving the tour, he, he just kind of knew what people would be interested in. But he was 101 years old when he went on the tour, and I think he actually lived uh, three three or more years, as a matter of fact. Now, where where is that? Uh, it's where all that? Is, it, is it a park now? No, it's a, in the midst of being converted into one. Uh, but I understand they're not too far from uh, uh, opening it. They saved the farmhouse, which I thought was a good idea. And Absolutely. Some, and some of the outbuildings and the barns. And, you know, it, so it, it's pretty much preserved as uh, Don's family, uh, you know, used it through the years. And I just think it's a wonderful thing. People will be able to go out there and, and, and visit a farm, a working farm. That's terrific. Yes. I'm wondering, I, I think you're involved with, with, I know you belong to, to several service organizations, including a, uh, a couple of Kiwanis clubs. Are you involved in, in getting speakers? I have been. That's been, uh, I, I kind of enjoy that. Uh, but uh, it's, I'm getting to the point now where I'm finally realizing that I need to turn some of these things over to the younger generation. <laughs> and we have a young man that recently joined our club. And he just thinks that's the greatest thing since sliced bread to be able to arrange to have a speaker come and talk to us. So it's nice to have some help. Yes, yes. And, and of course, we have a lot of people wanting to come because we're so large. But I think part of what, uh, what you do so well is finding people who really would be ha of interest yes. and who have something special to share. I read uh, newspapers pretty religiously. And if there's someone that's local and has an interest or that we would have an interest in, I'm, it's not beside myself to go and ask them if they'll come talk to us. And I think usually they say yes. Yes. Well, when I tell them we have uh, 150 members and we have 100 usually for lunch on Mondays, oh, yeah, that sounds a little bit intriguing to them. So they usually take me up on my invitation. Have you <laughs> ever been able to get someone who's in from out of town to speak? Oh, yes, yes. Um, well, Jim Branstadter, who is Detroit-based, but he's the play-by-play uh, our color analyst uh, for Michigan football, uh -huh. and uh, he has spoken to us a couple of times. Um, oh, Richard Cole, who is a, kind of an automotive guru, uh, has been to talk to us twice, and he gets top dollar when he goes in front of 
uh, audiences of business people. I so. bet he doesn't get top dollar at Kiwanis. <laughs> <laughs> well, we let him into our, <laughs> our recycled area, and he has a choice of anything on the shelf. <laughs> I see. All right. <laughs> I guess that works. Uh, anyone else from the Detroit area? Oh, let's see. Who else have we had? Um, we had a couple people from Crane's Detroit Business, you know, the uh, publication that uh, focuses on business. And, I used to be their star advertiser. They called did me you the, really? queen, the queen of the classifieds. I had a display classified that was the first thing everybody went to every mo Monday morning oh, because I always had a different uh, disguise and, and a different headline. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was the Monday morning laugh. <laughs> well, for several years, we had the... Uh, the head of the Detroit Bureau for the Wall Street Journal uh, come out and, and speak to us. And of course, that was you know very interesting. So uh, probably our most famous person was we had one of the justices from the Michigan Supreme Court talk to us. And uh, that was kind of a, a major coup for us because uh, they generally maintain kind of a low profile, you know, on their Sure. Their assigned duties. I'm wondering if you have uh, any interesting projects coming up that uh, you might share with us. Oh, let's see. We just had Red Berenson as our speaker last Monday, the hockey coach I spoke to you about. I'm trying to think who was on. Uh, you know, one, one of the speakers we're going to have is actually a panel of uh, fellows that are taking part in the, um, uh, well, the fellowship program that they have that's named for Mike Wallace. It's called Mike Wa or Wallace House. And these are journalists and uh, yeah, TV people, whatever, that take time off from their jobs and come to the U of M and spend a year here uh, pursuing a different research project while they're here. Well, I hope you'll invite me to that one. <laughs> Dale, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with, here with us today. What fun to hear about what you're doing, and won't you let everyone know where can they see these videos that, uh, that you and Jim Campbell have been putting together? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> it's on YouTube, and some people don't realize this, but if you have a major cable system that you subscribe to, you probably can access YouTube. I didn't even realize it until suddenly I, I just happened to stumble on it. But YouTube has a whole collection of different programs and uh, mine is Watchman of the Tracks. I call myself that because I envision myself being on a train that's speeding through life. People getting on, people getting off. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen when it comes to its destination. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to think about that. But seriously, um, it's YouTube.com and then backslash Watchman of the Tracks. All right. Well, everyone will know then uh, where to go. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Oh, it's my and, pleasure. And uh, we look forward to seeing some of those videos. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.